Okay, so uh, it, the title here I have is Collaboration for Structured Data, but as you see, as I go on, you'll understand why uh, it's actually revision control for structured data. So I'm, I'm Gavin Mendel Gleason, I'm the CTO for Terminus DB, and I've had a sort of a, a very eclectic experience in uh, computer systems and big data, including things like um, uh, chemical um, combinatorial chemistry through to uh, machine learning and um, search platforms, uh, content control, and then most recently uh, started uh, a database for revision control uh, called Terminus TV. This is gonna be a more general talk though about revision control and the general process of the way that we do data and data collaboration. So first I'm gonna give you an outline, a little bit of an idea of uh, what, the, what the talk is actually about. So first, the motivation. Why do we need structured data in the first place? Although it's a Procona, it's probably uh, people already know why you need structured data. But then once you've chosen to use structured data, what are some of the problems of uh, data management for teams that, that you need? And then I want to talk a little bit about the challenges that we have. Why can't I just use Git for uh, doing revision control? And why can't I just use my database? Now it'll turn out, of course, that you can use both of those things. But uh, I, I'm going to suggest that there's a better potential solution, uh, which is to use distributed data collaboration using revision control. And I'm going to try to motivate that through, through my talk. OK, so first, why structured data? Well, data is really core in the way that we uh, conduct the modern enterprise. It's really important for making the appropriate decisions about things. You need to have the right data. And in order to have the right data, you need not only to understand what it is, but you also need software to understand what it is. And if the software is going to eat the data, it needs to have some understanding of the structure of the data. So in order to make pipelines, in order to be able to do artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, in order to do surfacing um, of information for publishing. All of these things require structured data. In data analytics and data science, it turns out that uh, around 80% of the time in that, uh, that task is taken in data curation in the first place. So people are taking the data, they're, they're curating it, they're removing um, incorrect information, doing data cleaning, uh, making sure that it's correct first, and then that you, you put it through some machine learning pipeline, and you may have to massage the data, you may have to do some transformations of the data as well, and usually this is an iterative process, and a lot of it is just the curation end of things. So the data structuring and the manipulation of that structure is really core to all of the machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence and data analytics. Um, depending on where you are on that very variable uh, sort of pathway in terms of complexity of the analysis. So cur curation and editing to obtain this high quality data is therefore really critical. And you ha it has to be facilitated uh, for both machines to do automated cleaning, but also for humans to do uh, structured cleaning of the, the data and, and to make it uh, really feasible to use it as an input. And then on, on publishing of data, you need easy access to the data. So you need to be able to query the data. You need to be able to get the right data out. You need to be able to surface it in some way with the appropriate information about what's in there in order to construct the right kinds of outputs. So graphs, charts, forms, and web pages. So really our challenge right now is that data is still in the dark ages. We're really, we haven't really uh, solved a lot of these problems in a way that is convenient for programmers and for people who need to view the data, customers, et cetera. Uh, there's a lot that can be done here to improve the way that we uh, manipulate it. Some of it can be process controlled. Some of it, uh, of course, are these ideas that like uh, the prior speaker where we're, we're looking at ways and means of setting up um, approaches to the data. And that's really important, uh, but there's also technical solutions that can help us. So. Whether we're talking about structured or unstructured data, we're still doing it wrong. Uh, and you can see this in enterprises because of the way that they're actually using data in practice. So even in very sophisticated machine learning and artificial intelligence houses, you see people moving CSVs around to each other. And they're often slacking them, or they're emailing them to each other, or they're storing them on a drive with the suffix on the end of the CSV that gives you some kind of information about what its version is. We're repeatedly re-cleansing and reparsing information. So 
in the case of CSV, uh, the, there's no um, metadata about the data. You have only the column name is the, the only thing that you get by, by design. Uh, and there's not, not information about like whether or not something's an integer, whether it's a string that looks like an integer right now, but doesn't 10,000 down, uh, those kinds of things. So there's a lot of repackaging like that happens in the in these processes because there's no way to store that metadata in, in an appropriate way with CSVs. With Excels, it's slightly better. You get type information, but even then you don't get the version information. So you have a lot of uh, Excels that are floating around with different versions of things in them. And even if you go beyond that, there's still a lot of uh, a lack of metadata about the data. Now, there's structured ways you can deal with this. Uh, you, you can have CSVs that are coupled with uh, with another uh, metadata CSV, essentially. But then you have to have a process that keeps them coupled in some sort of way. Uh, and then then we have like Git, which is a fantastic and really important uh, inclusion in the software engineering lifecycle. So previous to Git, people were actually emailing each other uh, source code. I, I remember back then when, when that happened a lot more. And it, people who were more sophisticated often did use revision control systems, but they were quite closed, quite centralized, and they, they didn't have the same sort of uh, freedom that you get with Git. And they also were tended to be less sophisticated and harder to use. Although Git is, is very sophisticated, and can be hard to use for a lot of simple uh, operations. It, it works very cleanly. So one of the problems with Git, though, for structured data is that it doesn't actually maintain structure itself. It actually just maintains uh, information about changes to lines of text. Uh, and lines of text are great. For, I mean, they're not they're not ideal actually for source code, but they work pretty well. And the, and there's ways of getting around that. But it doesn't scale very well to uh, data type scales. So even sort of normal CSVs, you can you can often see in the 600 megabytes or, or even two gigabyte CSVs floating around, that becomes awkward to use in Git very quickly. And even if you are able to use this, which you can, and it's an improvement to use Git for CSVs as opposed to uh, slacking them, I would, if a house, if you had to make one change from from slacking them, I would say, you know, move it to Git first. That's a definitely, if you can, if you make that solution work, it's going to be better for you. Uh, but you, you also want to be able to have structure and discoverability. So these, these problems of repeatedly uh, reparsing and recasting data in order to use it in analysis are hard to solve permanently if you're just using CSVs. And you can't really query a, uh, a, a Git repository in the way that you can create a database, which is really convenient for surfacing data, for automated cleaning, for these sorts of operations. Now, at the same time, if, if you're a house that has managed to get a database into your uh, machine le learning, artificial intelligence, or, or analytics pipeline, then you're doing better than most. So a lot of them, uh, a lot of houses in practice do not. Uh, and it is a big improvement in a lot of ways. However, Databases are also awkward for this. Now, they give, give you all of this structure and discoverability, but they don't have a lot of the other features that, that Git has that are very helpful. So the revision control features, you can retrofit. And those uh, I've seen it, uh, people use a lot of retrofitting of revision control type features in databases. But that means you, you have to pollute your, uh, your schema or your data model with a lot of information about the revision control features. And the structure of that can be somewhat awkward. So whether it's by table, by row, how, how are you doing the revision control? You have to build all of that into your, um, into your system as well. And that can complicate things. Uh, and at the same time, it can, it can make things uh, awkward in terms of query. But it doesn't resolve a lot of the problems in changes to structure either. So if the structure is also changing, then you need some way to manage structural changes. And that requires some sort of uh, re revision control of the schema meta language itself. And there are solutions to that, but uh, I would say many of them are, are quite awkward. Some of them are, are not too bad, but it's an, an additional layer of uh, complexity that you have to put in. Finally, you have, to, you have to hand roll the way in which you do distribution. So, I mean, in, in some ways, it's, it, it is quite possible to, for instance, 
have uh, all of the clients that are trying to get the information to do some sort of analytics by taking it down in a query, doing some kind of uh, uh, transformation, some machine learning, and then putting results back into a table. But then you have this whole uh, problem of re revisions, maintaining them, making sure that everybody's collaborating in a successful way. And that, that's also a problem. Now, this, it, the, the database model tends to be very centralized. It's not very bottom up. So it, it, it pushes, it doesn't have to be decentralized, but it tends towards a very centralized model, which increases the cost of experimentation. So it makes it harder for people to do uh, test iterations, et cetera, because of the lack of the revision control aspects that Git gave us. So Git really uh, uh, did a great job here. It solved this team problem of collaboration with revision control. So it gave us a bunch of things. One of them is provenance. So we know who, who made which changes. We can see the revisions and the authorship. It gave us safety. So safety is a huge part. So lack of fear is what allows us to do experimentation. So if you have some kind of uh, code resource, you can feel confident. I can make a branch. I can try and experiment on the branch. If it doesn't work out, I can leave it. I can throw it away. Or if it turns out to work, then I can merge it back. And, and then you have, from that, you have uh, quality. So you can get CICD type pipelines. You can say, OK, well, you're not allowed to actually merge back and push this to, uh, mass to main unless you uh, have passed certain tests. So, and then, you, you know, in practice, in a software development life cycle, you may have multiple branches. So you might have uh, dev, canary, uh, and then production, or you might have four. I mean, I've seen even more complicated setups and lots of them make sense. So each of these stages can be sort of cascaded. You can have different kinds of acceptance criteria before you move on to the next one. And this brings us really to the main uh, reason that Git is such a great collaboration feature, and that's the distribution. So the ability to do push, pull, clone, and merge really make it so that all of these sorts of revision control features are not just revision control. It's not just about knowing what happened and when and which with, with which author. It's also the ability to communicate those changes. So you can take it offline to some place, do some experiment, make sure it works, and then you commit the whole thing as a trans transaction. And that transaction is also going into some end of the pipeline where it's acceptable. Uh, and when it's accepted, it won't uh, disrupt too badly other people's work and they can continue with it. <clears throat> so the solution that we really want for data is a database that's designed for distributed collaboration. So what should a tool that's built for collaboration on structured data look like? Well, going back uh, to, the, to the database, the database, so I'm a big fan of, of uh, both MySQL and Postgres were uh, databases that I've used a lot in the past. And uh, there's really big advantages to using them over say a CSV. So discoverability and schema, those are really important aspects. You want to be able to do queries. You want to be able to retrieve and update programmatically. So not just uh, updating a monster CSV file with said or something like that. You actually want to be able to do uh, a proper query, get back all of the results that match something, and then edit them in some sort of way. And the structure and typed entities are really critical. It means that like when you're doing data cleaning and casting, you shouldn't be resolving this problem every time you ingest it into a machine. And that's not just an inconvenience or a time uh, problem, but it's also a quality problem. So there's many times that I've seen uh, where it works most of the time, and then some of the time it doesn't work because there's some casting issue with one of the elements, uh, and that can then cascade into other problems further down the line. And machine learning, this can be a big problem in terms of uh, actually processing. So Having a schema, though, uh, it, it is so critical, but it also means we have to pay attention to schema migration. And that's going to, that's pro probably one of the most awkward points for current databases with revision control. So the other aspect that we need to have built in, I think, is uh, revision control. Scalable uh, to typical data set sizes. So you know, not all databases, actually most 
databases tend to be less than two gigabytes, uh, and the vast majority of them are under 100 gigabytes. So those sorts of scales will solve most people's problems. Now, a lot of people think they want to go immediately to sort of internet scale, uh, Google size databases, but most people's problems are not actually that large in practice. So we need to be able to at least deal with these typical data set sizes that we see in practice. And of course, as it gets easier to use big data sets, people start pouring even larger data sets in, which is always a problem of efficiencies. But we want that provenance. We want to be, to be able to have authorship and commit time and these sorts of things uh, built into the way that we manage our data, especially in the artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning area. That's, it, it's really critical that you know uh, how, when a data cleaning uh, took place, what was run, whether it was a automated procedure that was doing something, uh, and so that you can do, do quality checks on it and then per, perhaps even roll back to a previous step and try try again. Uh, and so that's it's really useful if you have that visibility where you can see what was changed by what and how to go back and, and undo it. It gives you a lot more control over your pipeline. So pipelining itself, modern CI CD architectures work because of the ability to do branching, to do these sorts of tests, to do all of those uh, elements that really make it possible to do continuous integration and continuous deployment. And finally, we want, we want safety. So branch and rollback allow the experimentation that you really need because you don't always know what you have to do to the data to curate it ahead of time. Once the pipeline's all set, you might think, oh, okay, it's grand, but actually even uh, once you have a process, you wanna be able to go back and increment and change the process, fix the process, get higher qualities out of the process. And that means you have to have visibility of what's going wrong and where. And with uh, a lot of pipelining solutions, they can, it can feel like you don't know where it's gone wrong. Uh, and it can be a debugging situation to go back. Now, if you have the visibility of where the changes take place, that can solve a lot of problems. And it has been a big advantage in code. So, uh, and that brings me really to the thing that I think is most critical about revision control, which is collaboration. This was the thing that really made Git a sea change. And it's why Git is better than uh, Subversion was or, or some of the other ones. It's this multi-mastering sort of push-pull peer-to-peer -peer interface uh, really made it amazingly cool for doing uh, programming. And it turned out like uh, that that's really sort of the right way to do it. There may be better ways in the future, but it's certainly a, a sea change and really improved things over how it was done before. And that, that collaboration is enabled by the revision control features. So you want modifications to be safe. So when I, uh, so, for instance, when I have a uh, centralized database, it's often the case that you get a, um, a, a sort of contrasting interest between the person who's running the database and the people who are trying to use the database. And a lot of times it can feel like a pull only type scenario. You're only allowed to do queries and get the information out because they don't want you to pollute the database with information that will screw it up or change information, et cetera. And so in order to have that sort of push and pull architecture, you need these uh, revision control features. So it's the collaboration is facilitated by this revision control. Uh, so that the effective collaboration requires revision control distributed between collaborators. So we need to be able to push, pull, clone. And part of this is, is because we, we want to be able to work offline, but sometimes you might say, if I'm doing a machine learning pipeline, offline might not be offline from the database. It might be on a large server that has a large number of uh, processors, uh, GPUs, et cetera, that's designed for running the kinds of problem I want. And what I want to be able to do is pull or, or clone a version of the database locally, do some processing on it, come up with some feature set, uh, enrich the database with new information, and then push that back after uh, it has passed some acceptance criteria. And in order to do that pushing and pulling, then you really want to be able to distribute deltas. So Git does this uh, delta manipulation. You, you move around deltas between um, client and server or in a peer-to-peer -peer type of fashion 
So we, we want to be able to store data as deltas, and, and that would be really advantageous. So then finally, uh, in order to do change management, you need merge. You need the ability to figure out how to combine different deltas when different deltas happen uh, from the same tip. So you need to do it properly, to do a distributed writes, you need to be able to do merge. And uh, you also, if, if you want uh, to move data around, data has a very, oftentimes, uh, it has uh, security implications. So you want to be able to move it around in an encrypted way, if possible. So there's multiple solutions to this problem. Uh, there's not only one way to do it. You can do it inside of uh, the database. You can do it with uh, custom tool chains. Uh, and you can use you know, CSVs and Git, which is an improvement for a lot of uh, houses from what I've seen people doing it in practice. But then there's also, there's a new, uh, a new series of open source databases that have come out, DVC, Dolt, and Terminus DB, which all give you these sorts of revision control type uh, collaborative aspects. So if you're interested in an open source solution uh, to collaborative revision control for graph databases or complex data sets, uh, you should give a, a Terminus DB a try. And uh, you can also check out check out uh, the others, TBC, Dolt. Thank you. Hi, Gavin. Um, we've got a couple of questions that have come in for you, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, first one is, is revision control really going to become a major feature which is used in data content management? Yeah, I would say absolutely. So, I mean, okay, so if you look at uh, data content management in some kind of practical system, uh, for instance, uh, something that's widely used, WordPress. Okay, so what they did in WordPress is they ended up having revisions inside, internalized into the system in the database. So it's already used in content management systems like, like WordPress and many other uh, will have some sort of revision control aspect. And then when they started trying to add uh, features to their uh, records, then they ended up building a sort of internalized graph database inside of WordPress on top of uh, MySQL, or usually on top of MySQL. So they also realized at some point that in order to do the revision at a fine grain, you would also need to be able to have a sort of graph database internalized. So I, I would say people are, have been forced into this solution but they also didn't get the collaborative aspects that have made uh, Git so so popular as well. So I think there's no question in my mind that as we go forward, we'll, we'll see more uh, um, looking at from first principles, how to do revision control aspects with data. And, and from my own experience in machine learning, uh, really people are uh, like, what a, the more forward thinking people are starting to use Git a lot to do their CSV management. It's really, really horrible to just be slacking CSVs to each other, but also it, it like I said before, the uh, trying to surface it just in a database, a centralized database, is quite awkward as well. You're going to have to build some kind of revision control aspects into your database if you're actually going to allow different experimenters. And, and with machine learning, you have to experiment. You don't know the answer a priori. You have to test different feature sets against each other. You have to see whether or not this uh, channel works better than this other channel in terms of uh, trying to determine features. And that experimentation means that somehow you have to be able to feed all the information back, be able to make comparisons between them, perhaps on different branches, for instance, and, and then choose which one you want to go to production as the, the way that you're going to identify uh, classes or, or features. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, second question, which is kind of a question of, it's almost like two parts to the question, so I'll give you both parts in one go. Um, is it possible to merge a structured data, is it possible to merge structured data, structured data effectively? And the other part is, Git merges are a nightmare. Will this scale? Yeah, those are both very good questions. So um, the part of, okay, so one, um, it is possible. You can do it. Uh, merges are complex, and that's the that's the reality of of merges. 
in Git, you don't have very much information about the semantics of, of what you're having. So I alluded to it very briefly previously that uh, a line of text uh, can work all right for source code, but it's actually not even ideal for source code because the, the computer doesn't know what the AST looks like. And there's lots of merges that could be av avoided or you could know how to resolve the merge conflict if you understood something about the structure of the data. So if you're given more structure about the data, if you have information about cardinalities, et cetera, like that, then you can, you can come up with strategies for uh, automatic resolution. So uh, there's not, um, it's not going to be a perfectly solvable problem in the sense that there's a, a way to solve it in all cases, but there are a number of things that you can do. So one of them is the patches that happen in Git tend to be manual. You need to be able to have a, a query language that allows you to do the resolution of uh, merge conflicts when they occur. So uh, coupling strategies, more structure, and uh, queries for automatic resolution of merge conflicts will get you a lot of the way there. Then there's, uh, you know, that you can do other things subsequently where you do have a merge conflict. You could say, well, okay, well, this one has to win, and then somehow we're going to have to calculate a delta out of this, and then and then you're going to have to come up with some kind of uh, automated structure, usually, because the amounts of data, the, the quantities, can be quite large. Now, if you're doing smaller revisions then usually you could just do the choices by hand. So in a lot of content management type situations, those uh, merge conflicts can be sorted uh, just by a human curator. So there are uh, cases where that also is going to be a, an option.